So welcome everyone to the Agile Professionals Meetup. Um, <clears throat> thank you for coming here a week before Thanksgiving. Uh, for a little bit about REI Systems to start off. So uh, REI Systems, we're a uh, mostly a contractor for the government specializing in high-end software solutions, uh, helping government become do its job better, um, mostly in the areas of grants management and open transparency solutions. We also work for NASA as well. And uh, two years we were, uh, we were awarded top workplace by Washington Post. Uh, that, that means a lot to us because that's a completely employee driven survey. Uh, we're very proud of, of this place, so check us out. We're, we are lots of positions hiring right now. Um, so go check out our website and uh, see if this might be the place for you. Uh, today uh, we have uh, two, two speakers speaking today on a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and I'm sure to many that work in this area, especially those of you who deal with uh, government and trying to deliver software in a government ATO environment. Um, uh, what I liked about uh, Gene, and, Gene and Ryan is that I saw them uh, presenting in the All Day DevOps uh, conference, which is an all day online only conference, uh, I, that we saw a lot of learnings around that, uh, that topic. Uh, and uh, what really, what really um, uh, impressed upon me was Gene's kind of war stories and lessons that he pulled away from trying to achieve DevOps in a government setting. And uh, I, I really thought they were going in an interesting direction. They, they made some really good achievements, uh, not just in tech, solving technical problems, but also solving people problems as well. So that's why I asked him to come. He was available, and so I'm really happy to have him here today. Uh, let me introduce to you Gene Gottimer and Ryan Kenny. Give him a hand. You can plug in. Um, Ryan's going to hand out a, a sign-up sheet. If you guys want to. Sign in for us. What we'll do is send out the slides and the worksheet we're going to use because this is going to be um, interactive. Um, we're going to we'll hand out the worksheet in just a minute when we get started. But go ahead and start. Um, so when I was talking to Matthias about doing this, uh, like I said, I did a talk at All Day DevOps and it was about lessons learned um, getting continuous delivery into some government organizations. Uh, and I work for a company called Caveros, and we have a few of our colleagues here, including Ryan. Um, and we do a lot of government contracting, obviously, since you're, you know, we're in this area, so it tends to be a lot of the work. Um, and we've had a lot of good success getting some very different projects into some very different types of organizations within the government. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, uh, Matthias said that he wanted, you know, they like something interactive. And so we have this uh, workshop that we do about setting up a pipeline, all right? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through setting up a pipeline and we'll throw in a bunch of war stories about some of the stuff we've done in the government, some of the stuff we found, but hopefully you come away with an idea of ways to improve your own pipeline um, at, at, at your own places. So um, real quick about Caveros, like I said, we are, uh, we're contractors in this area. We do a lot of Agile transformation, DevOps transformation. We do training, we run conferences. Um, we have a couple open source projects, Secure CI, which is a, a bunch of DevOps tools, just uh, CI tools and DevOps tools put together that are all open source and we've already integrated them. And one called Selenify, which some of you heard us talking about. It's a layer uh, framework on top of Selenium to make using Selenium easier. So um, we work, like I said, all different contractors or all different uh, contracts all around here. We did work actually with HUD here at REI um, a couple of years, about a year ago, two years ago, I think. Um, I wasn't on the project, but we do work for big companies, small companies, big government agencies, small projects, government agencies, kind of all over the place. But what we wanted to talk about first was the pipeline. So how many people here have a delivery pipeline? Okay, the answer is really everyone. Right, because the pipeline is just the way you go about delivering software, right? However you do it, it may be mostly manual. Like, yeah, we'd love to have it completely CI, CD, 
right? Everything automated. But the reality is, any way you start out with, I have an idea or I have code that gets checked in and I need to deliver it to my customer or I need to <coughs> deliver it to production or right, put it, push out a release, that's your pipeline. All right? and that's, so that's really what we're gonna talk about. So it's the process of taking a code change from the hands of developers and getting it deployed into production and delivered to your customers. Right? It may be manual, it may be automated, it's probably some sort of a mix. Um, and you have kind of stages along the way. We'll talk about what those stages are. Uh, but the idea is you start out with, I have code, and I don't know much about it other than I've written it. <coughs> By the end, you want to have high confidence that this is something that works in production or that will work in production, and it looks like production. And we're really trying to find out, do we have a viable candidate for production? Right? Is this code good enough to go out? Give me a second to read Dilbert just because we love Dilbert. <laughs> All right. I will send, like I said, if you pass around this, the uh, sign up sheet, we'll send out the slides afterwards. So, this is an example of a pipeline, right? It's, this is not prescriptive. This is not the way yours should look exactly like this or anything like that. But this is kind of the way, you know, a, a representative pipeline might be, right? You start with the code going in up top and it flows down to you're eventually deployed in prod. And along the way, you have all different checks, right? And those checks, those points where you decide, hey, is this worth going on? Is this dead in the water? Is this no good? Those are called quality gates, right? And if we set up a good, well-automated uh, or, or well-defined delivery pipeline, a lot of times those quality gates are, are points of no return, right? If you, if you get there and you fail that gate, we don't keep going. We don't say, it was close enough, we're gonna keep going knowing there's some bugs or knowing there's some failures. We're just gonna say, hey, this one has problems, we know there's these problems, let's go back to the beginning, get those problems fixed, and we'll push it back through again. And the idea is, at any given time, you may have multiple builds going through this pipeline. Right? You have multiple pipelines running at the same time, it's not just one. We start up at the top with quick stuff, quick feedback. Things are easy to find out. As we move further and further down, the pipe, the checks get more expensive. Why? Well, because we want to get rapid feedback up here, but we're really trying to make sure that we've answered all our questions by the time we get to the end. Right? We're again, we're trying to answer: Do we have a viable candidate for production? And so we go through more and more expensive quality gates. So more expensive in the sense that I've spent more time on the product, so now any time I I put into it is more valuable to me. And in the sense that hey. Most of the things that I'm doing down here take a lot longer to run than the stuff that I did up here, right? So it's more, more of an investment, more an investment in time, maybe more difficult to do, may require more resources, more expensive resources, different tools, stuff like that. So what we're trying to get is rapid feedback up here, like let's say unit tests, right? But by the time we get to the end, we want no surprises, right? So along the way, we kind of have to balance that we can't do everything up front, but we also can't leave everything till the end, right? So we're trying to get this balance. And that balance is really this balance, right? Balance the early rapid feedback with the idea of no late surprises. And the way I usually like to think of doing that is to do just enough of each type of testing early in the pipeline to determine if further <coughs> testing is justified. And what I mean by that is, if I wait till the very end to do any security testing, well, then I'm setting myself up for a late surprise, right? And that's your traditional waterfall method, right? We'll save the most expensive thing to last, <coughs> but if we run into problems, we're gonna have to make a call. We're either gonna go live with it and live with the, live with the risk, or we're gonna have to scrap the whole thing and go back to the beginning, because it's not something we can tack on at the end, <coughs> right? So what I'd like to do is, let's do a little bit of security testing up front, a few minutes few hours, whatever it takes, to give some feeling that, you know what, I've done a little bit of security testing, I can do a little bit of other types of testing and get back to the official security testing by the end. But by the time I turn it over to the security team or the compliance team or whoever that is, I want to have a pretty good feeling that they actually uh, are not going to find anything, right? I want to have a good confidence that this is ready for them. So let's talk about defining your delivery pipeline. Right. What I'm going to do is, uh, Ari, Ari, actually, can you hand them out? 
um, <coughs> some uh, worksheets back there. We're going to hand, hand a, uh, one or two out to everyone. Go ahead and take what you need. Um, there's some pens there too we can hand out. And what I want you to do is just think about a pipeline you have. If you have multiple, multiple projects, multiple uh, processes, that's fine. Just pick one that's representative or think about what you're trying to get to or, or you know, whatever the most complicated or simplest, doesn't really matter. Um, and just write down what are the steps it takes for you to go from an idea to release? What are the pieces that go in, right? And we're going to take a few minutes. You should discuss this with your neighbors. Uh, but what we want to come up with is a list of all the steps and then two columns. All right? Wait time and work time. Wait time is the amount of time it takes <coughs> for you to, once you hand this over to somebody, let's say some approval, how long it sits on their desk. All right? The, the work time for an approval might be 10 seconds but the wait time might be up to two weeks, right? Um, feel free to pick an average. We're just looking for rough numbers, right? Even in fact, if you don't pick numbers, you could just say this is minutes, this is hours, this is days, right? But what we're looking for is how much time is this spent waiting on something to happen and how much time does it actually take, right? Some things might only wait for a few seconds, right, to get picked up automatically, but they take hours and hours to run. Other things, like I said, like an approval, might sit on the uh, on someone's desk for days, but only take a few seconds really to execute. All right. So go ahead and start talking through it, Ryan. Do you have any? Uh, you um, want to go through some examples here while we while you do this? We're going to give you like ten minutes to work on this. Yeah. So I would say again, even things that get, especially the things that get triggered automatically that you don't necessarily think about. Um, Static code quality analysis. Is your code being analyzed by Sonar Cube? Do you have unit tests? Um, you also want to break them into, if you have different test phases, um, if you have, say, database integration tests versus unit tests, you know, mark them down um, <coughs> if they're executed significantly differently in your pipeline. Uh, for government projects, again, all of those approvals and all those client sign offs <coughs> that you need, uh, you're going to want to capture those in here too because those are. A, uh, an actual part of your pipeline does will have a, a real impact. Any particular place you want us to start, like code check-in kind of thing, or you either or start a code check-in, or if you have a lot of process before that, like a lot of people have a significant, we have an idea. There's a lot of vetting that goes into it, and start there. Right. The idea is when you come through this, you will get to the end and say, oh, look, there's a lot more steps than I thought about. Right? Now they call this a value stream analysis. We're doing a very, very simplified version of it. But a value stream analysis, what you do is you list out your stream, that's what we're doing, and then you go back and you assign values and you weigh them against the time invested. Okay? We're not actually going to do the value side of it. We're going to stick with a nice simple piece, which is just what are the steps. Um, but you could actually, I'll give you some references at the end on, to look and actually do a real value stream analysis. Um, we, we try to recommend to anybody trying to adopt Agile or continuous delivery or DevOps to do a value stream analysis early on in their, uh, in their project. Get a feel for all the steps. Um, we've done some training and we've done this at the trainings before um, where we've done it at a private <coughs> setting. So, you know, 20 people in a room, all of them from the same company, all of them working on the same product and split them into two groups and find that they come up with very, very different streams, which leads to some really interesting discussions like why don't they know or why don't they agree on what's involved in, the, in their pipeline if it's supposed to be the same one? Do they not realize there are all these extra steps, which is usually the case? Did they not realize or they just forget that all these things go on behind the scenes when they're not the ones doing the handoffs and all of that? So. Value stream exercises are very important in doing, uh, or value stream analysis is very important in trying to do lean, is really where the technique comes from. Has anyone ever done a full value stream analysis before? You yeah. have? How long did it take you to do? Um, and how, how big was it, I guess? How, how involved? Well, it was <clears throat> extremely large. Um, <coughs> now it's about, to about a month. And how many people did you get involved in doing it? <coughs> a couple hundred. So typically speaking, value stream analysis, you're supposed to have somebody from every facet of the company. And depending on how 
in depth you want to get, every facet of the company may be a lot more extensive than you normally think. We're not talking about just the development team. All right, give me another five minutes or so to work on this. Like I said, try, try to at least just come up with a rough idea of all the things. If you're not sure all the pieces that go in, that's fine. Does it involve both the capture of the information and the analysis of it and then decision points after that? Yeah, so like I said, we're going to skip the value side of this, uh, which is the important piece if you're trying to determine, like, really, is this the right process? We're going to do more of the arrangement uh, because it's easier to do and we don't need to have everyone involved. Uh, but we've actually found in a lot of cases that just writing out the steps is actually enlightening. People start thinking about it and like, oh yeah, that's right, there's, there's three extra steps in there, oh yeah, that's right, we need a couple approvals in here. And they start looking at the times and all of that and they start realizing, wow, I can see already there's, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of places where I have opportunities to improve and places I could make these things better. Yeah, and I've noticed there's a lot of places have it defined at a process level, but there's no big visual of that visualizes that. And so unless someone actually sits down and <coughs> takes like an hour to read through the process documentation of it, it's not easily accessible to them. You yeah. know? So like I was saying, we've done this at, at a class before. One of the, one of my favorite ones, um, we were teaching at one particular place, they split into two groups, came up with two different value streams. They immediately got into a discussion of why theirs were different and started over, overlaying and realized that they, you know, they were just forgetting different pieces. Um, we had, we've been doing it on flip charts, just so we could stick them up on the wall. They gave up on that and took over an entire wall of whiteboards. Wow. And we spent like the next two hours, it was supposed to be a, a 15, 20 minute exercise, we spent the next two hours drawing it out just because it was showing him so much about the problems they were having. And went down one, down one line, circled back, and they started realizing they had things like three or four approvals in a row, none of whom they had any uh, confidence that the people that were approving actually read any of the documentation they were sending in. They were just signing off, but it sat on their, on their desk for a week at a time. Um, so literally four <coughs> weeks where it was sitting on desks that you said, well, at the very least, <coughs> parallelize this and put it on all four of their desks at the same time and have them all sign off and, you know, group back together afterwards. But even beyond that, why are, why are four people signing off on it? And we, we know they don't under, understand all the details. They're relying on us to say, this is ready. And they're saying, okay, I'll, I'll sign off. Do you also consider the size of the work that's going through the pipeline, like the batch size, basically? Um, not really, because what you're trying to do is find out, like, what's your process. Okay. But batch size obviously comes up to how you, comes into how you use it, right? Mm -hmm. What we do find is very, very long, complicated value streams tend to have very large batch size because they can only afford to go through it so many times, right? If you can speed it up, you can eliminate waste, you can afford to put through much smaller batches, which has the increased, you know, better feedback, more, more, more chances to make decisions, lower risk per batch, <coughs> all those things. And you'll find the more in-depth you can go and the more uh, minutia you identify, the, you're, you're actually going to find bigger value out of it. So like we, we did this exercise on my last project and basically we're able to identify uh, certain security analysis we were doing that basically wasn't being processed or analyzed uh, later on down. So we, we were running, running the tool, we were running Fortify and then our security team would do very little with the results. And it was by, by actually mapping it out, I mean, you know, you would think it was obvious, but when we actually mapped it out, we're like, hey, uh, you guys don't do anything with this, yet this takes a tremendous amount of time why are we doing it? Um, now the correct answer there is to then utilize the results, which was the, the end effect. But <coughs> actually writing everything out will help you identify sort of these yeah. inconsistencies in, in your own pipeline. Yeah, especially in government where you yeah. have people from different departments participating and they don't know what's happening earlier in the pipeline. They don't even care. They don't want to. Yeah, when, when everyone's siloed and in their own little bubble, it's very easy for things to get lost <coughs> in translation. Um, so in large organizations, and especially for government projects, you'll see that happen all the time. One of the lessons from Lean is actually the number of handoffs is a, is a big issue, right? The fewer handoffs you have, the, the smoother you can get your pipeline to run. 
um, which is, you know, the handoffs are going to happen every time you have a silo of information or a silo of, of, of effort. So, all right, anybody still need a little bit more time? We all pretty good, got some basics. We're going to go back to this over and over and revise it. So, all right, perfect. Okay. So, here are some examples of one. We'll send out, like I said, we'll send out the slides, you'll be able to see them. Um, but the idea here is just writing it out tells you a lot about, like, oh, yeah, that's right, we have a lot of steps to our process. But the idea is to hopefully tell you where your bottlenecks are, what types of things you might want to automate, right? Things that have long wait time or, or long work time that might be good for, optical, or for automation. And where time is being spent and wasted, and we've told you already some examples of those, right? Um, so let's look at different ways to arrange it, right? In our experience, the best way to approach a pipeline is to divide it roughly into three stages. Now these are gradual changes in focus, not hard and fast, we're passing out of this stage into a next, but a gradual change, right? When you start out, first thing you usually do is, is code focused, right? How's the code? Is code written correctly? Did I do what I thought I was doing, right? Unit tests, for example, right? Does everyone here use unit tests yeah. code, right? And a unit test does what? It doesn't actually test the code. It shows that the code does what the developers intended it to do, right? So it's really looking at the code itself, not at the quality of the product. So we start out kind of code focused, and then we gradually move over to <coughs> quality focus. And quality ends up taking most of the pipeline for most people, right? We spend most of the time doing functional tests, regression tests, acceptance tests, security testing, performance testing, any non-functional testing, UI testing, all of that, to the point where we decide, you know what? I'm pretty confident this is ready for production. I'm pretty confident I'm ready to release this or give it to my clients, right? At that point, when you say, you know what, this is ready, I'm gonna push this out there or I'm gonna release this, that's what we call the end game and that's where it becomes delivery focused, right? We have some stuff we need to wrap up, we need to package, we need to finalize the documentation, we need to take new screenshots, we need to get our marketing department involved or our customer support involved to say, hey, new stuff is coming, get ready for this, right? So we gradually migrate from doing stuff on the code to doing stuff in the quality to doing stuff on the delivery, right? The time frames for those can be radically different. In general, the stuff, we, the time we spent on the code is minutes, right? Maybe hours, but probably minutes, right? How many here uh, know what CI is? That's yeah, just about everyone. How many people here do have a fairly well-defined CI process where you're doing continuous integration, right? Just a few, okay? How long does that usually take, right? The, the argument is usually that you set your continuous integration to be no more than 10 minutes, right? Because what you're asking, generally speaking, is to do your unit tests, your static analysis, and give feedback to the developers before you let them get up and move on to the next thing, before they get up and go to the restroom, before they go out and meet with their friends, or go out to lunch, or go grab coffee, or anything like that. Because if that pipeline is broken at that point, if their build is not good, you don't want to push anything else through the pipeline. You want to hold everything up until we get that fixed. So we try to we try to hold that to minutes. Then the bulk of the process happens with continue with quality focus, and then at the end we have whatever it takes to get the delivery focus out. Right, the end game. Can we get this released? And that most of the time is hours, could be days. Right, depends on on who needs to sign off. Are you printing hard copies of? of your pressing disk, you, you're printing hard copies of documentation, <coughs> does it actually need to be sent out? We did some work on a, um, in a regulated, embedded environment. We were doing uh, heart pump monitors, right? So FDA had to approve it. We joke around a lot with the software we write, and I'm sure you guys do, that you know, at the end of the day, even if you write buggy software, nobody dies. When you're doing stuff with heart pumps and, and that type of thing, if you write buggy software, somebody does die. So it has significant regulation around it, significant governance around how it gets released. The end game for that is significant, right? They have to package up a release and send it to the FDA along with a list. Here's exactly the changes we've made. Here's the verification we have that it works. It's not breaking anything. 
there that we've tested it, we can show that we've tested it, all that. Right? So that might take, you know, in our in that case might have taken weeks or months. Right? On the other hand, if you're pushing out changes to a website, that might only take a few minutes, right? It may take hours, something short. Does that all make sense? All right. The frustrating part is when the deployment process due to burdensome processes and checkpoints and approvals take longer than the quality uh, yes. side, right? Yes, right, where you just have artificial bottlenecks <coughs> built in exactly. for processing. Right. 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 Or, or when there's someone in the delivery stage that actually is trying to ask questions about the code. <laughs> yeah. Why, why is that, that there? <laughs> exactly. So, what we're going to do, we're going to go through this and, and look at these three stages. So I already kind of described these. There's the commit stage, right, which is code focused. Focus here on rapid feedback, because we said we want to balance rapid feedback with no late surprises. Well, this is definitely the rapid feedback section of the pipeline. Right? Do we have a CI cycle? It's probably a 10 minute maximum. When I say it's a 10 minute maximum, when I suggest to people when they're putting in continuous integration, I don't mean that there's something magic about 10 minutes. It's not that nine minutes and 59 seconds is fine, but 10 minutes and, and one second is, is somehow bad. What I mean is we really want this to be two to three minutes because we want something really rapid. Five minutes is okay. I know by the time you get to 10 minutes, it's too long. So you know, I'm just putting a hard and fast cutoff there. So that's as long as I generally think I can keep a developer chained to their desk waiting for the results. If it's any longer, they're gonna get up and do something else. They're gonna start surfing the net. They're not just gonna be watching to see, hey, did this build work? Do I get, do I get my rapid feedback? So since they're waiting, we try to limit that to 10 minutes. Now there might be a few steps that happen after that 10 minutes. You might be doing some additional unit tests. You might be doing some additional stuff analysis. Right, where after the developers get to get to leave, get to do something else. But in general, we're talking about minutes to hours here, right? We're, we're talking about something small. We move on to the quality focus, right? And that might be something like, hey, after we deploy, right? We're doing a, um, after we do the unit test, we might deploy the test and run some automated tests. We might do some manual tests. We might get as far as we're deploying to some pre-prod environment or some staging environment or something like that. But whatever it takes to go from, I know I, I know what I built to this is good enough to release, that's the quality focus. And you're really trying to, the, the acceptance stage rather, it's really quality focus and you're trying to decide, is this a viable candidate for production? Is this a viable candidate for release, right? That's what you're trying to determine throughout that. And then the last piece, like we said, this steps that only get done once we're ready to release and um, doesn't begin until you're pre pretty confident, doesn't have to be 100%, but you're pretty confident that there's not going to be any surprises. So this is where you're saying, you know what, we can release this. I might do some last minute checks, I might have to hand it off to my security team or my performance team to do their official blessing to actually sign off on it. But when I hand it off to them, I don't want the feeling that, geez, this is really a crapshoot. I have no idea whether this is gonna work. I really wanna hand it off to them, feeling, okay, they, they might catch something that I didn't, in which case they've added significant value, right? But I've done at least some due diligence that I'm not likely to get caught with something really easy, something really obvious, like the system just doesn't work. Doesn't work. So, we're just gonna take a couple minutes, and what I want you to do this time is actually talk to your neighbors about how you split it up, but just draw two lines in there. Split this into into the pieces. Where kind of where is it that you switch from commit stage from the code focused to the quality focused? And where is it that you switch from quality focused to delivery focused? And what we're hoping that you might find in this, or what we're hoping you won't find, but what you might find, is something that's wildly out of place. Like Matthias was saying. Down here, do you have someone looking at the code? Right? Are you doing a code review down here? Or way up top, are you doing some early acceptance test for some reason, even before you get back unit test results? Right? Because if you have a lot of trouble defining these three areas, it's one thing if you have, I don't know whether this line goes here or here, but it's somewhere in this area. But if you have like, oh geez, these are kind of end game focused and these are end game focused and it's kind of all over the place, 
then maybe you need to look at reordering your pipeline. Mm -hmm. All right. So like I said, talk to your neighbor about what you what you found and what your pipeline looks like, and and try to determine you know do you have anything that's really out of place, and is your pipeline kind of arranged in the right order? All right, let's wrap up for a second here. We'll get back to this again and look at another piece. But I do want to talk a little bit, uh, I was just talking with Steve, and uh, he was mentioning doing some work at, at, on stuff that was performance critical, right? And that's actually the section we're going to get into here, looking at not waiting until the end, but talking about balancing the early rapid feedback with no late surprises. But Steve, you want to tell them a little bit about what you were just talking about with me? with the performance? Well, I was just saying, I work for an organization that uh, we worked up a large code base, I guess you could say who they were. We're doing the core router pro routing protocols for Ericsson, and because of the scale of things, these are like their routers for Netflix, that had to support a million simultaneous sessions, so you couldn't wait till the end, performance test, because just wrote some code, what if it didn't work? So the steps that were in the yellow box there, we deliberately tried to push back and parse into the coding phase, but the, but the goal being to move that as far back up the chain as possible. Right, and now that's what we, we talk about when we talk about doing DevOps, we talk about shifting left, right? That's that's the left piece, right? Is moving it closer and closer to the beginning with the idea we're moving left to right. Um, so, and again, the idea that we're doing you know, just as much testing as necessary to prove whether further test testing is justified, as Gene mentioned before. That's kind of the general approach to how you ship things left. That's kind of what we're going to talk about now. Um, so again, no late surprises. You want to balance your early rapid feedback with making sure you don't discover something until the very end. And a lot of times that is performance testing. So like, what can you really do? So taking a look, uh, we broke things out into our commit stage, acceptance stage, and end game. So taking a look at some uh, fairly common pipeline steps. So we've obviously got to build and compile the code, um, obviously. We want to run our robust suite of unit tests, and we want to do some sort of static analysis. How many people do no static analysis or don't know what static analysis is? <coughs> Anyone? Everyone's got static analysis? No, you can go over it. So sonar cube yeah. is a perfect example. We use that. For, for you can describe it. For you. Sure, you want to go? Sure. So static analysis is all about analyzing your code, and in some cases your tests, to identify what are commonly called as code smells, or things in your code that maybe indicate that the design you took or some particular pattern you're using isn't the best. Again, this is, in the commit stages, it's very code focused. Um, your software can still run as expected. Um, it may pass all your functional tests. That's why, you know, you want to do this early. It's very quick. You can find out if developers are using best practices. We can find out every um, the state of the code, identify tech debt early. Uh, that's really the goal behind static analysis. And somebody mentioned SonarCube. SonarCube is a great tool for doing that. Um, so if you're not using it or using a similar tool, I highly suggest uh, using SonarCube. Does anyone here, does everyone here use SonarCube? Anybody not? Our team uses SonarCube. You use SonarCube? Yep. Great tool, free, open source orchestrates a lot of uh, static analysis tools to run, no matter what language you run in. I mean, it, it was set up originally for Java, but it does C Sharp, .NET, it does Python, it does Ruby, they have plugins for Scala, for COBOL, for Fortran, PLSQL, right? Any type of language you can imagine, somebody has spent some time uh, putting it into SonarCube. You run other tools that collect the data. It's not actually providing much in the form of doing the static analysis, really collecting the results. It does some for Java and, and maybe for, for C Sharp. And, and for those with uh, more modern front ends, it does JavaScript as well. Yeah. So there are also plugins if you use um, like ESLint, it's a very popular JavaScript linter. SonarCube supports that as well. And it's a great dashboard for all that information, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. one of the things about collecting any sort of data is if you're not getting feedback out of it, Right, it's not giving you any value. SonarCube is a great way to do that. Do that stack analysis, show it in a way that gives you some rough guides as you know, good code, bad code, but also lets you drill in and, and see specific problems and all that. The other thing that uh, you can get out of static analysis in general, SonarCube will help help with it. But um, it actually does some 
uh, security testing. Right? In particular, it can look for a SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh, some simple cross-site uh, request forgery stuff that doesn't need to be found dynamically, and even race conditions. Right? Race conditions, when somebody hits this button and this button at the same time, and it's a race to see who gets there first, can be really, really difficult to try to recreate in, in the wild, <coughs> recreate in live systems. But Static analysis can use path analysis to find out where it's possible, and it can actually do a much better job of finding it statically than you could dynamically. So there is some, some security pieces, some simple stuff. It's not full-blown security analysis, but it's valuable. And again, static analysis is great. It's not gonna find everything. Um, just something to keep in mind, but no one stage here is the silver bullet. No tool is ever going to find all your problems and make your life completely easy. But if you're not doing any static analysis, adding some kind is going to make your life a lot better. So anyway, so ends our sonar cube plug. Um, so now we're taking a look at our acceptance stage. So again, uh, here you're going to see some stages that maybe take a little longer. Um, you've got your, again, your suite of functional tests. You've got some regression tests to make sure that, you know, as a part of implementing feature A, you didn't break anything from feature B, C, or D. Um, you want to have acceptance tests. Does this code do, you know, what it's supposed to do? And these might be these might be manual acceptance tests, right? If you're yep. just you're not doing any automated, you're not doing anything with Cucumber or JBehave or anything like that. This might just be the stuff you used to traditionally write on the back of the story cards, right? What are my what's my acceptance criteria? What what is it going to take for me to say this story is done? Yeah. And I mean, in a perfect world, you automate as many of these things as you can. Some things you, you tend not to automate, like exploratory testing. We'll talk about that a little later. But um, even if it is done manually, you know, that just factors into your overall wait time. Um, system integration tests. So again, integrating with other systems, um, you know, maybe that you own, especially in like a microservices world, or with external systems. Uh, you see that a lot with these government projects, you have to integrate with other government systems. And a lot of times the logistics of doing that are not so straightforward. So again, these, these tend to get pushed out to here. So now we are talking about the end game. So we have our security testing. Um, we've got our performance testing. Again, things that are fairly expensive. Maybe not expensive in terms of time um, or money, but other resources as well. A lot of these tend to be fairly manual, um, you end up having, you know, you have to cut off an entire environment. Uh, if you're still working in the realm of, you have a set number of static environments, a lot of times, especially for performance testing, you have to close off access, only the performance testers are, you know, hitting it with all their performance tests. Um, that's expensive, it cuts <coughs> people's access to things. Exploratory testing, again, tends to be highly manual. You want testers to have as much time to really explore the system uh, as they can. So the, this tends to get put <coughs> off until the end. Same with usability testing. It, does this really function? A lot of times, you know, depending on who you get to do your usability testing, uh, their time tends to be more valuable. It, it's harder to get people to, you know, to come and do these highly manual tasks. So it gets put off till the end. Game. Who, who does 508 testing here? Or who is required to do 508? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's another, it's a specific, a specific example of usability testing, but frequently, again, pushed off the yeah. end. It's expensive, it's hard to do, it's hard to do right. So for those of you doing 508 testing, how many of you have, um, how many of those tests are automated? Or do you have somebody manually go through with like a screen, screen reader? Automated? We have different levels of 508 checks yep. at each stage. Okay. So we have like code level 508 checks at the commit stage. Yep. And then some 508 steps at the acceptance stage with like other tools. Yep. And then we have an actual like impaired person at the end game yep. testing it out and and checking it. Yep. So that's good. Um, a lot of places on our my last project FFM, uh, they their 508 testing was 100% manual, and so that without a doubt was ended up being in these later stages simply because it took so much time and energy. So it's good that you have, you've got it all throughout, that's fantastic. Uh, so moving on, then you get some, you know, like Gene was talking about earlier, some other things, some other miscellaneous things that may or may not apply, um, whatever sort of packaging you have to do for uh, an official release, 
any printed documentation or non-printed, however you deliver documentation to your client, um, release announcements, things like that. So one thing you'll notice, um, and some, some others were noticing this when they were going through their own value stream, was, well, these security tests, performance tests, exploratory tests, all this is in the end game. And we specifically said we don't want to have any late surprises, right? And this looks like a recipe for late surprises if you're waiting until the end game to do some of this testing. So what do you do? <clears throat> now, just simply saying, well, we move it to the acceptance stage doesn't really do a whole lot, right? Like, I could just say we're doing it in the acceptance stage, but if I'm still doing it with the same frequency that's in the end game, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just running the line at a different point. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so what we have to do is actually rethink this. Um, and, and how do we do that? Uh, again, Gene mentioned before, do enough testing to prove that further testing is justified. <coughs> so we're going to break this apart into the, you'll see the screen sort of change quite a bit. So let's look at the acceptance stage again, down past system integration. So we're doing some security testing. Maybe we're not doing all of it. Maybe we're doing um, just just enough to, de to determine whether, um, hey, are we likely to find any vulnerabilities in this Fortify scan? No? Okay, well, let's go through and do the full security analysis then. Um, a performance trend. I can generally tell by <coughs> virtue of my other tests that I'm running whether the system is generally getting slower or faster. Um, if the system is getting, you know, dangerously slower, then like, hey, maybe we don't need to do our full performance test suite. Let's look at why this happened. Um, early exploratory testing, and Gene has some good war, war stories on all of these, um, but early exploratory testing. We don't have to wait till the end game to, to have testers really looking at the code, um, or not the code, excuse me, the app. So we can start that exploratory testing earlier on and then do more in-depth exploratory testing later. Uh, basic usability testing, again, uh, you mentioned having your 508 testing sort of spread all throughout. There's different ways you can do 508 testing that lend themselves to these different stages better than others. Um, so when we look at our end game, what we see now is a, a little bit more specific. Uh, on We're not just doing security tests, but we're doing our mandated, again, government institutions love to have this checklist of all sorts of security requirements that you have to have uh, met. You're gonna be doing that in the end game um, any other sort of mandated full security test suite that you can come up with, you'll do that there. Um, hopefully you prove that you know, you're not likely to find anything. You still may, but you're at least a little bit more confident uh, that you're not going to. Your full load and performance test. Now here's where you really let loose against the system. Um, you're going to have your more expensive, both again in terms of time, money, and resource usage. Uh, you're gonna be running those more expensive tests here. You're continuing your exploratory testing, and you want to do your focus group usability testing. Again, getting those actual, uh, those actual uh, 508 you know, type in, in, in impaired users to use your system. Uh, we don't want to have them constantly doing this all the time, but now we can get an actual focus group to come in and you know, really use the system. Yeah, it's exactly what you were saying, right? You said you've done some at this point so that you know you're not completely wasting their time by the time you get around to it. And the expectation, at the very least, is not I expect I'll find some problems, right? If you think back to the old waterfall model where, where each of these really involved throwing it over the wall, right? Everyone knows what that term is, right? I throw it over the wall to the next group. I was teaching this class, to, to teaching a DevOps foundations class one time and the company that I was teaching to said, well, we don't use that term throwing it over the wall. We call it the grenade effect. <laughs> Not only do we throw it over the wall, but when it gets to the other side, we expect it to explode, right? And that's what we're trying to avoid here is have some really high confidence, really feel good that, hey, when I get to that last step, I, I'm not likely to see something. I may, right? If I, if I was 100% sure I wasn't gonna see anything, there'd be no point in doing the further testing. But at least I have a good feeling about it, right? So moving on. Um, we want to, like I said before, we want to do just enough testing to determine if further testing is justified. So that's really how you can break apart <coughs> these heavyweight end game tasks and you know, sort of bring some value over into the acceptance stage. So taking a look a little closer, um, Gene, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, so let's say, let's talk about performance testing, right? So often states save to the end. Sometimes it has to be an official load and performance test. It has to be done by a specific group. 
in a dedicated environment, no other traffic, so you can really see how much traffic you can push through the environment. So it's it's isolated, so you're not getting any var variance in, in your in your numbers. Um, the servers might have to be production size, so you get a real feel for what it is. And it might be something like we have to pump a thousand concurrent users through for four hours, or maybe it's ten thousand concurrent users for forty hours. Who knows, right? There's all different types of load tests, soak tests, stress tests that you could be doing here, right? And what you're really trying to see in, in, in a full load performance test might be, what is the sustained capacity and throughput, right? What are the numbers I can tell, hey, we can set an SLA by this, right? And that's great information to know, and it's important to know in a lot of systems, <coughs> right? But to do that type of testing, I really do need to wait till very, very late in the game, right? And especially if this is a third party, or within my organization, a separate group, I really might need to wait until this is the end. I might need to get this scheduled. The wait time on this might be significant. We've had plenty of projects, especially government projects, where this was a separate team, and you need to turn this over to them a week in advance. And you said, they said, I will do this test. It, would take, it actually was four hours for us on that particular uh, DOD project. It will take us four hours to run the test, but we can't tell you when we'll run it. You have to make the environment available to us, and within five business days, we'll tell you it's done. All right, so it's a significant wait time for that, even though the, the work time is four hours. So the so solution they, we they, they you're saying they just give you the traffic, and you have for, for and they just have to run. No, in this case, we had to we had to freeze the environment and hand it off to them, and um, they were responsible for doing the test and giving us back the report, but. They were booked with other projects. They weren't part of our team. So all they could tell us was, hey, sometime this week we'll get to it, right? So our solution to it was to bring stuff forward. And we did this really successfully on the DOD project. Uh, and we, what we did was we did a short JMeter test. Anybody here use JMeter? Really good performance tool, open source. Despite the J, it's just written in Java. It will work with just about any language. Um, and it will actually, and I'll tell you in just a second, it will actually work with uh, web traffic, it will do uh, database traffic, do all sorts of, of testing of services and stuff like that. Um, what we might do is just rather than dedicate an environment with no other traffic, maybe we'll just go ahead and say, hey, we'll just run on our dev system. Who, who cares if it's isolated, right? We'll get some variance, but we're really just looking for some rough numbers. And rather than a thousand concurrent users for four hours, Maybe we'll just say, how long does it take for 10 users hitting it once to get 10,000 requests through, right? That might only be in the case of this DoD project I was on. We could do that in about 15 minutes, which is why we picked that. We said, you know what, we'll spend 15 minutes, we'll get a rough number, and we'll just hold that. And we'll just see, what's the trend? Are we getting faster or slower? What had really happened was, the reason we started this, was we were doing some work on, anybody have to do the STIG? Anybody know what the STIG is? Secure Technical Implementation Guidelines. It's put out by NIST and it's put out by, uh, by DISA. If you're in the DOD, they're very, very similar, although not 100% identical, but for all intents and purposes, same, same type of list. It's a list of best practices. It says, if you're not using the server as a web server, don't install a web server software on it. If you are installing web server software on it because you're running as a web server, here are the types of things you should lock down. It shouldn't tell you what version of the web server software you're running, shouldn't uh, expose certain <coughs> known uh, directories, shouldn't it be able to do directory traversal, that type of thing, right? And it's just a list of a checklist <coughs> of things to fix. We were going through that for our database to make sure we had all the auditing that the STIG required. And we put the auditing in, and it generated a lot of log output, which makes sense, that's what the auditing was. But we immediately noticed that it felt like things were running slower. Now, anybody that's ever done any performance analysis, you know that generally, like something that feels slower or feels faster, it takes a, a difference of about, as a rule of thumb, about 10% for someone to actually notice it. We weren't sure we were really noticing it, and we didn't have any hard numbers, so what we did actually, we backed out all our changes onto a branch, we went in, we took a JMeter test, and since we were looking at database traffic, we analyzed our database traffic logs on the production server and just said, hey, what are we normally running? And we came up with a list of, it turned out, six different queries or four different queries represented 85% of all our traffic, right? Which makes sense. I think most people's systems you'll find after the first couple of 
queries or types of hits or whatever you're analyzing. It, it, it's, there are a few really popular ones and then it tails off fairly quickly. So we took those 85% and just came up with similar queries and we made a, a, uh, a suite of tests in JMeter that would run in that same proportion those types of queries and just got a number. We said about 15 minutes worth of tests and then we had that as a trend. We put our changes back in, we ran it, and sure enough, we were significantly slower. It was about 15%, so it was something we should have noticed. We did some tuning, got it back to about the spot where it was supposed to be, but then we kept that trend in there <coughs> so we could always see that, hey, things are going about as fast as they were before. Didn't need to be exact. We were just looking for wild different differentiations, right? And in fact, we just actually, we were doing this all from Jenkins, as the CI engine, and it was just drawing a graph from us. We didn't look at anything raw numbers. We just looked at the graph, and if it looked like it went up, hey, things were going slower. If it looked like it went down, things were going faster. If that wasn't what we expected, we'd just dive in and say, hey, why is this, right? Rerun it, maybe it was just an oddball, maybe something else was happening on the system, since again, we weren't doing isolation, but maybe we'll find something interesting now. And we liked it so much when we did that that we went ahead and looked at the web server logs, did the same type of analysis, came up with the same type of thing for our load and performance on the website as opposed to just the database, and we ran 10 to 15 minutes of that test too and, and just tracked trends from then on out. It was very successful in giving us some real confidence that we weren't really changing the speed of the system or unless we were intending to. And again, what we did here was we went from a specific, you know, real need number to something just, are we getting faster or slower? Just give us a rough feel so that if we turn it over to these guys to do their actual tests, pretty good confidence that we know what they're gonna find. They're gonna find that everything worked out about the way we expect. Right? So we did that with performance, but you could do the same type of thing with security, right? We were talking about doing just enough of any type of, uh, of one type of testing early to see if you get uh, if it's worth doing more so in our in that same project um, well we, we took on security into our department or into our project uh, for the same reason that most people do and that was we got hacked we ignored security for years didn't pay any attention to it because it was somebody else's problem it wasn't our group right we, we weren't responsible for it uh, but then we got hacked one of our cloud systems we left a um, a security, a, I'm sorry, we left a password default. Somebody got in and started using it as a mail server. So mm -hmm. Shut it down immediately. Uh, the lesson we learned there was once you're in the cloud, there's no such thing as a dev system or a test system. They're all important systems. Um, just because it doesn't have nuclear launch codes or state secrets doesn't mean somebody's not going to find it interesting. Right? But we had put off for a long time because we had a, a, a group that did this type of scanning. They did HP Web Inspect, which for whatever the installation we needed was somewhere around $300,000 at the time for the system we needed, way out of our budget. Um, it had to be done by the corporate security group to be of any official value. And it was looking for black box, black box web vulnerabilities. Do we have any cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgeries, that type of thing. Um, they also scanned, that was the web application we were scanning. They also use Nessus, which scans systems. What are the ports that are open, what software is installed, what users are configured, that type of thing, right? And they're looking, is the system compliant? Do, do we have any known compliance holes, things that we agreed that in order to put it in this data center, we need to have closed down, and we've missed it, right? So we said, well, we can't do that type of stuff, but we have some options, right? So we tried answering the same questions with different tools just to give ourselves a feel. So, next slide, right? What we did is we said, well, we can't get HP Web Inspect, but we can use OWASP Zap. Has anybody used the OWASP project, open web uh, application security project? Lots of great tools out there. They have this one product out there called OWASP Zap. It stands for the Z Attack Proxy. Anybody here ever use Fiddler? Right? This is something very much like Fiddler. It just sits in the middle of, you, of your browser and the system you're checking. And it just watches traffic going back and forth. And while you're doing that, it can watch to see, do I see any evidence that this might be a cross-site scripting vulnerability or cross-site request forgery? 
<coughs> we actually did on our project was we had a lot of selenium tests. So we took those selenium tests and pumped them through OWASAP just while we were doing our normal functional testing. Right? So we got basically for free, we got some traffic pumped through a security scanner to tell us, are you seeing any cross-site scripting vulnerabilities? Right? It did not officially answer what the security group was doing. It didn't provide us a report that would say, hey, we are 100% secure, like they were trying to do. But what it did was give us a feeling, hey, when we turn it over to them, they're not likely to find anything. Nessus, we couldn't get in-house at all. It required a big site license. We weren't a group that was allowed to have it in our part of the government. But it turned out Nessus was an open source project many, many years ago. And when it closed source, some people took the open source version of it and kept maintaining it into a product called OpenVAS, Vulnerability Assessment System runs the same types of tests, works very similar. The UIs have diverged over the years, but it essentially does the same thing with the same types of checks. Um, but we could do this weekly. And so what we set it up to do is, hey, every Saturday, we run this scan on our dev systems. And then at Saturday afternoons, we run it on our test systems. And every Monday morning when we came in, we could take a quick look at the results and say, things look good or things don't. And if we saw problems, we could get it into our process to fix it on Monday morning. By the time we were ready to release every other Friday, we'd know those were in. The end result was we knew ahead of time was Nessus likely to find anything. And one of the side effects that we never saw coming out of that was um, the guys that ran Nessus in the, uh, in the data centers, the <coughs> guys, uh, start giving us a call. They say, hey, look, we're about to shut down all the boxes that don't have this patched or don't have this fixed or don't have this hole closed. But you guys are always proactive about it. So rather than shut you guys down for a day while we ask you, we'll just ask you now, are you guys fixing this? And we say, yeah, we, we found it in Saturday scan, so it's going in on Friday. They're like, great, you got other people to worry about. We'll fix, we'll leave you guys up. You guys are already, you, we've already you know, established that you guys will have it fixed on Friday. And they had confidence that we'd have it fixed. Why? Well, because we always seem to. We always seem to be ahead of the game, right? The other thing was that it was always going through our normal pipeline. This wasn't an emergency. Hey, there's a new version of Java out there. Drop everything. Let's get it pushed through our system to see if everything works. We just work it into our normal test path, right? We just come out the other end, and if we ran into any problems, we could fix them along the way, right? So. Like I said, with the performance, we were looking, maybe we can look, change the question a little bit to get some confidence. Or in this case, maybe we could just use some different tools in the case of security. Maybe it doesn't replace the official scans. Maybe it doesn't replace what needs to happen. They still need to do a security scan at the end. But we're pretty confident it's not going to cause any problems. We're pretty confident we know what they're going to find. Thanks, Jim. So again, the whole point in doing this is we want to find problems earlier. And a lot of you have likely seen um, this diagram before, which basically illustrates um, the differences in terms of cost of finding a, any particular defect earlier in the feedback cycle versus later in the feedback cycle. And as you can see, it's, it's exponential. The, life, the longer it takes you to find um, the same defect, uh, the much higher cost you're going to have. So having a, quick, a quicker feedback cycle is key. We want to do this testing earlier. We want to do as much things sooner in our pipelines so we can catch defects sooner. Um, like Gene mentioned before, you know they're finding these security vulnerabilities before you know the, the official security guys are even asking them for it. And then you know that shows that hey, these guys are on top of their game. They're finding stuff earlier. We don't have to worry about them as much. Um, it's easier to fix problems that are found if you find them sooner. Again, developers still have the context of their changes. Uh, let's say it's a bug in the code um, or something, you know, some sort of application logic that the developer needs to fix. Um, if I'm a developer and I catch a defect like this, you know, the next day versus three weeks later, for that same defect, it's going to be a lot quicker for me. Like, oh yeah, I was just doing this yesterday versus, oh well, geez, three weeks ago, what, what the hell was I trying to do here? Um, and then I've got to go back and relearn you know, what exactly it was I was trying to do, trying to diagnose all this stuff, it's not fresh in my mind. Um, 
and by virtue of doing that, you're going to have a less defective product. So you're not constantly going back and fixing you know, old tech debt. You're, you're fixing problems earlier on, your product stays um, at a higher quality at these later stages. Um, again, your response should be proactive, not reactive. Um, you want to be the one going out and finding these problems before they're just sort of, you know, you don't chuck the grenade over the wall, wait for the explosion, and then have something kick back to you. You're the one finding them, you're the one fixing them, and by the time, you know, you, you, you hand off uh, the application, everything should be good. Not always, but, you know, as many defects as you can reduce earlier on, the better your life is going to be. So let's go back and uh, take a look at our value stream again. So basically what we want to do is ask a couple of questions to yourself. So when you find a problem, how much does it disrupt the pipeline? And we want to look at both the time and effort expended on a particular build um, versus the next build that's in flight. So what happens when you, let's say in your functional testing, you identify a defect. Um, how does this impact you? How much time is lost um, at one stage versus another? Now, here's another key part. Does chaos ensue when problems are identified late in the pipeline? So we're talking about later here, um, end game slash sort of the end of your quality focus section. Um, is, it, is it a big surprise? It has the commitment to release already been made and will they ship it anyway? Now we talked before, the answer to that should be no, right? Um, well, on several projects, again, the one I mentioned before, uh, healthcare.gov, there were a number of times that because the release cycle was so arduous and so painful that by the time we got to the end game, um, we had identified some sort of problem. Uh, there were a few times it was a, a security vulnerability and basically management had to make the decision <coughs> to like, what is the likelihood that we're going to get, be attacked um, you know, through, this specific, through this specific vector? And they would say, well, there is a possibility, but the amount of time it would take for us to go back and fix it isn't worth holding off the release. And they would basically get CMS, the government agency in charge of it, to sign off on it saying, hey, we understand there's a risk here. Um, let's just go ahead and release anyway. You find those problems earlier on, that's not a question you're ever going to ask. If you're finding a problem here or here, no, let's fix it. Why would we, why would we go through and release it? We haven't invested that much time. Um, it's the sunk cost fallacy, but in many cases it's what drives people's decisions. Um, if we've already invested a tremendous amount of time and we need to make this release now, people are going to release anyway. So that's the other question that you should ask yourself is, pardon, when you have a problem found, are you, is your team likely to release? Uh, sometimes the answer is yes. Yeah, You're we gonna, found this on, on commercial projects especially that it becomes a business proposition, right? The, the product owner, the management has said, we're releasing on this date, or this is the version that's going out. And we get to the end game and realize, hey, there's something significantly wrong with it. There's some problem we'd really <coughs> like a few extra days, a few extra weeks to work on and fix it to get it right. The, the trade-off becomes the risk versus the business value. And the business value is almost always gonna win at that point because it's a, possibility that something goes wrong, right? Possibility someone steps across that problem or finds a security hole or trips up on that particular bug, but it's a guarantee that you're not getting the business value if we don't release. And so almost always we've found that the business people will make that push and say, hey look, we set this date, we're going with this date. I'm not, I'm not stopping the release based on a possibility that we're gonna see this problem show up. So, yeah, go ahead. Let's take another five minutes here, talk to your neighbors again, go through and, and look, start at the end game and work back and look at, are there, are there steps in there that you often find problems that, you know, that come up on a regular basis or maybe infrequent, but that's your kind of your riskiest step? Mark those with an up arrow, right? Just to remind you that it's probably something you want to do some of at least higher up in the, in the uh, process, but also, Talk through with your neighbor and see, is this the type of thing that we really stop on? Like we take security really seriously. If we find a security hole here, we're not releasing. Or is it more likely that we find it and we say, yeah, whatever, we'll fix it later. Go ahead, all right? 
So go ahead and take five minutes to go through this again. Talk to your neighbors about it. Let's wrap back up and let's go back into this last section. So what we're trying to do here is find some of these late surprises, right? And identify places where we might want to move things earlier. Things where it might be valuable to at least have done some earlier checks so they're not down there at the end, right? Um, so push it up into the quality focus section or start identifying, hey, we had some steps in here that really weren't all that valuable because we're doing all these checks up here, but it wasn't until the end game that we're finding any problems, right? Maybe it's what Ryan was talking about with security scans. You do a security scan and no one looks at the results. <laughs> so why are we wasting time up here doing a security scan if we're looking at it down here and then finding the problem late anyway, right? At least do the analysis up earlier or maybe skip the analysis entirely because it's just not giving us value. All right, we have one more section to go through. So automation, again, uh, everyone's favorite word. And as a DevOps engineer, you know, this is like my bread and butter, but I'm going to try to give you, you know, sort of the, the cold hard facts of <laughs> when it makes sense to automate and maybe when it doesn't. So a couple things you have to keep in mind, automation isn't free. Uh, you have to get management that's committed to this fact. If you could just instantly automate everything, then everyone would do it and everything would be automated. But it turns out there's an upfront cost to automating any particular task. And one thing that you want to ask yourself is, you know, budget the cost. Is it going to be worth, is the amount of time saved by automating this task going to be worth the initial time, effort, tools, and training required in order to automate it? The answer isn't always yes, but the answer oftentimes is yes. But you have to keep in mind that the answer may not always be. So you want to look at how does this change your process? Um, by automating something, you inevitably have to change the way people operate. Um, there's a cost associated with that. Again, it goes, it sort of ties into the training. Um, these, things, these things come with a price. You're going to need dedicated resources. Not everyone can automate something. They might be good at doing a manual task, but ask them to automate it, and it's going to be uh, significantly challenging. Just because it's not, as, it's not as simple as, okay, well you do this task all the time, just do some DevOps at it and make it happen <laughs> automatically. It doesn't work like that. Um, so setting realistic expectations, having everything 100% automated is fairly unreasonable. I will say my current project, Pecos 2.0, um, we were talking about that a second ago, it's a Medicare enrollment system, again, for CMS. Um, we're, it was a Greenfield project because they were completely rewriting the old system. It is not 100%, but it's very close to having the infrastructure and all the deployments automated. Um, it's about as close feasibly as I think we can get. It's still not 100%. And there are things that we basically decided, um, tasks that take like five minutes to do automatically, and we do them like every couple months. And it's like, you know, we'll automate this when we're, you know, when we're not in the middle of implementing all these other things. Right now, this doesn't take a whole lot of time. Um, so sometimes maybe maybe we will automate it one day, but it's it's not causing us a whole lot of harm right now. Um, now that said, when you do automate something, you can't expect that the benefits are going to be immediately obvious. A lot of times, the benefits of automating something happen after several iterations when you realize, oh wow, I don't have to do this thing manually anymore. And then there's some sort of side benefits, which is whoever's time was consumed doing this manual task is now freed up to do other things. And you don't necessarily associate the time they're now spending doing other things as the value brought by that automation, but it absolutely is. So you have to take all these things into effect when deciding whether or not this particular task should be automated. I, I heard a great explanation. You know, a lot of people come to DevOps classes, and uh, especially testers, they're often worried, hey, my company's going DevOps, we're gonna do continuous delivery, right, we're doing more automation. Am I losing my job? Now, I can't answer that, obviously, for their specific environment, but we often tell them, look, chances are no. If you think back to stories you've heard about the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, right? Everyone was afraid that all the machinery, all the con conveyor belts and the, the automation in the factories were gonna take everyone's jobs. It didn't happen, right? There were more jobs. People spent more time doing other things. The simple repetitive stuff, they didn't do anymore. That's really what we're looking at when we're automating testing, automating deploys, automating anything in our pipelines. Let's, let's get rid of the repetitive, simple, stupid, objective, no human thought necessary type jobs. And it's not gonna get rid of anybody's job in general, right? What it's gonna do is free those people up 
to do something useful, to do something productive, to do something that actually requires some thought, some subjectivity. And in that case, you know, as Gene pointed out in other industries, you know, the key is you have to adapt. So when the market changes, you adapt to the market, you learn new skills, and you make yourself relevant again. Um, so the fear that automation will destroy jobs is only true in the narrow sense that that particular action does not need to be solely performed by a particular person. Instead, people can do other things. People can learn how to create this automation. People can learn all sorts of things. Um, so moving on, I talked about automated deployments. One of the most useful things to automate and things that frankly should be automated is your deployment. You want them to be repeatable and therefore they become reliable. You don't have to worry about human error. Um, and if you're doing these things frequently, if you're, if, you're, if you're using your same automation to deploy to dev, to test, to staging, to pre-prod, whatever, um, if you're using that same automation, it's effectively you know, you're not going to have problems if, you know, the same problems you would have if the only time you do this automation is to production. So you're going to catch these problems sooner in your automation, um, and it, it just makes everyone's life easier. Uh, so having the same deploy process everywhere is key. Um, keep things consistent. Keep, take as much guesswork out of the equation as possible is really what you want to do with these automated deployments. Plus, if you spend time working on one deploy process that you use to do your deploy to dev and your deploy to test and your deploy to staging and your deploy to prod, whatever, right? It's the same process everywhere. If you spend any time making it better, it pays off across all of them. Or conversely, if you're spending time only working on one of them, yep. right, you get to concentrate on building that one up rather than splitting it between three different deploy processes, one for dev, one for test, one for prod. Yep. And again, um, I don't know how many of you all are using uh, containers or any sort of uh, virtualization, maybe like VMware or something like that. <coughs> it, once you get into that realm, especially with using a tool like Kubernetes and Docker, uh, you'll find that the ability to do automated deployments is easier than ever before. Um, and what that means is you're gonna find more reasons to deploy. It's why continuous deployments have become a thing. Now that we can do this very easily, um, it turns out that deploying changes to production, think in more of a Netflix way, it doesn't happen as much with the government, but the idea is if we can deploy more and more frequently, it enables us to do, to, to do real CD, real continue, you know, constantly integrating our code and constantly pushing it to production. Um, and what we've done in, in some of our government clients is to define continuous delivery as being able to deliver via a business, as a business decision, not a technical one, all right? How many people here have to, do with an air, have to deal with an air gap? In other words, you can't deploy to production, right? It's not just as easy as pushing it out to production. There's some step in the way that, that is by definition and by design manual, right? What we said is, look, we're never gonna get past that. We're never gonna automate through that, or at least not in the foreseeable future, right, without getting actual policy change. But what we can do is say, getting up to that point knowing that whoever has to push the button on the other side to get it to move further down the line, if that's a business decision and I have high confidence it's going to work, well, I, I've, I've achieved continuous delivery, right? I'm leaving it up to the business whether we deploy it. It's not, no longer a will this work or can I get this to work or what do I need to do to get this to work. And by having a, a system of automated deploys, we can make that repeatable enough and reliable enough that we can make those calls a business decision. Yeah. And again, the only way you can really go from continuous delivery to continuous deployments is to build that confidence based on your pipeline, based on these stages. If you can have enough, um, enough assurance earlier on that your code is solid, that your app works as intended, that's really the only way to get you know, these air gaps removed. In the government, maybe one day it will happen. In the commercial world, it's already happening. People are doing it. Um, so moving on, smoke testing. This is, uh, so this is key when talking about any sort of deployments. So this is kind of another way of thinking about, uh, you know, do enough testing to decide if further testing is justified. Smoke testing is all about testing the deployment itself, not necessarily the application. So it's got to be quick. You got to do it after all of your deployments. And you want to focus on things like the basic signs of life. Uh, can these systems talk to each other? That gets increasingly more important if you're in a microservices architecture. Um, 
you want to check that all the configuration settings are you know good and working. Um, the reason this is important is again, like Gene said, I don't want to go and try running my functional test only to have a bunch of weird errors when really the problem is that my deployment's busted. Um, so the fact that these are quick enable me to save a lot of time. I don't, and again, especially if you have uh, manual testing being done in these environments, I don't want to waste my manual testers' time uh, finding out <coughs> my deployment's busted. So these are essential whether your deployments are automated or not, but especially if they are. So, back to the value stream again, uh, this time with a focus on what is automated. So, if something can be automated, you know, what does it take to automate? Would it actually remove any bottlenecks? Could it be moved to earlier? And would it reduce late surprises? Uh, to decide whether something should or should not be automated, you, you know, the answer to these tends to be yes. Uh, if the answer is no to a lot of them, then maybe it's not worth, worth the effort. Um, where are your manual tests? Again, wait times are critical. Things that take a larger amount of time, um, you, you tend to want to automate because that's what's going to save you the most amount of time. So in order to facilitate this, go through um, each of your tasks and mark manual tasks with an M, um, automated tasks with an A, and then really hone in on those manual tasks and see what makes sense to automate. Obviously, what we'd really like to see is the A's yes. migrate towards the top, the M's migrate towards the bottom, and then start, as you improve your pipeline, start removing some of the M's, making the A's, yeah. right? But if you start seeing here a mix of M's and A's all the way through, maybe you're spending a lot of time waiting for manual stuff when there's just automation running behind it. Maybe you could switch some stuff around, get the automation running in parallel with the manual steps, or before the manual steps to get some better better throughput. Yeah. So let's go ahead and we'll take just another two minutes. We'll do this and move on and finish it up. Uh, All right, just in the interest of time, let's wrap it up here. All right, everyone got everything marked? See the M's and A's? See where you have some opportunities? All right, well, let's just wrap this up really quick. We can, we'll stay around and answer questions and tell more stories if people want, but want to get you out of here. Um, one of the things we do at Caveras whenever we have a talk is we do something called the Caveras Five. And it's our five most important takeaways, the things we think are the biggest pieces, uh, the biggest steps you should take, things you should take away from our talk. So on this one, our Caveras Five, balance early rapid feedback with no late surprises, right? That's, you're trying to arrange it so you have a good feeling going into the end game, not, geez, I hope this works. I'm just throwing it over the wall and this is likely a grenade, right? Um, do just enough of each type of testing early in the pipeline to determine if further testing is justified, right? And, and Ryan gave a great example of the smoke test. If you're doing the deploy, don't you want to know if the deploy worked before you set off a two-hour suite of regression tests on it to, to, to run it? You know it's not going to be useful if the deploy was no good, right? But that goes through everything. And, and Matthias was saying, you know, if we do, you know, 508 tests and we can do some testing all the way through, by the time we get to the point where we've, we've brought in a specialist, right, this is what they do, we're not completely wasting their time because we've seen some of that type of testing run. Your pipeline should generally progress from code focused to quality focused to delivery focused, right? The commit stage, the acceptance stage, the end game, right? Basically, they're rough guides. There's no hard and fast line between them. Right? But generally speaking, if it's something code focused, we want it early because we can generally do that stuff faster. And if it's something delivery focused, we can wait till the end because we're only doing it if we're deciding this is something we want to release. Consider automation to help remove bottlenecks. Right, Move those M's to A's or shift them around. And, and finally, this whole exercise, use value stream mapping to help you understand your process. At least get a feel for what's going on. Am I doing things in the right order? Am I doing all the things I'm supposed to? Am I doing a lot of things that I had no idea why I'm doing them? Right? Um, one idea that people have given me for doing this is when you get back to your organization, if you want to keep doing these, uh, look at doing it per feature or per story or per task and actually just give everyone one of these sheets and write it down. Just have them go through all the steps they go through. And see, did you forget a lot of things in your value stream? Were there a lot of extra steps you hadn't thought of? If you just record them as you're doing them, a lot of times you'll find there's a lot more steps, a lot more minutiae that you normally would just roll up into one when we're sitting here. 
Um, and start recording actual time. Get a feel for it. Uh, someone's suggestion was just to put this up on a whiteboard or on a flip chart or sticky on the, on the wall and have people just start annotating as they go through it. And over the course of a couple sprints, you end up with a pretty well-defined value stream uh, and really see what the times really are. The nice thing about doing that, if you, if you have people actually record the times, the wait and the work times, the work times people generally have a pretty good feel for, right? at least you know minutes versus hours or hours versus days, that type of feel. But wait times, a lot of times you'll find that there are a lot of significant wait times that you forgot about. Spend a lot of time waiting for a system to be available, waiting for someone to sign off on something, that type of thing. Um, and yeah, once you start recording all that, make it visible. Put this on a wiki, put this on the wall, keep track of it, and use this to drive retrospectives. Use it to, to keep it up to date, keep looking at it when someone comes to your uh, organization, your group, your project and says, hey, we have a new step for you. You have a new, something new you have to do now. You always have to do this piece, this administrative step or this approval step or this other type of testing. Add it in, keep it up to date and, and see how it affects your other things, right? Because you can keep doing this on the fly incrementally. Um, real quick, well, like I said, we'll send all these out, uh, but these, this book right up here at the top is the one that I've seen most often recommended if you're actually trying to do a real value stream. Like I said, this is tip of the iceberg stuff that we're doing here, but Mike Rother and John Shook wrote Learning to See Value Stream Mapping to Create Value and Eliminate MUDA. <coughs> Um, I have no idea what the MUDA is, but this is the Japanese the, work. What's that? Japanese. Japanese. <laughs> so the whole point is this: this is like the the guide to if you want to do your own value stream mapping, grab that book. And he's got actually Mike Rother has a couple of books out there. Um, for those of you that are less into the reference guides and more into, I want to read a little bit of a story on it. Um, the former CIO of USCIS, the Custom Information <coughs> Service. Um, Mark Schwartz, who made a lot of headlines around here. Has everyone heard of Mark Schwartz? Right, in this area, he's pretty well known. He was making a lot of changes to the way he wanted the government to do acquisition, to, to build software, to acquire software. Um, and he talked about in this book called The Art of Business Value. Um, it's a fairly easy read. A lot of people really like that as a explanation of where things are, where value is really being added and where you're actually spending time doing the right things. Uh, real briefly, our company, we do, do training. Uh, we have some training coming up in Atlanta in first week in December, um, but then the second week in December, that's software testing. We do a DevOps week where we do some foundations of DevOps, uh, a, leadership, a class for leadership to do DevOps. And then we do some hands-on, uh, in parallel to the leadership training, we do some hands-on with Docker and Kubernetes, Chef and Jenkins, um, that I have more information you're interested, we do have a code. If you wanna sign up uh, for coming to the meetup, we can get you a code to get you some 20% off. But that's the second week in, in December, right around here, yes? What's CTFL? Um, it's, a, it's one of the um, it's one of the testing certifications. I don't know what the, what the group is, but the, the test automation class actually comes with a certification for people that are interested in it. Our foundation of DevOps actually has a IC Agile certification if you're looking for that. And if you have any questions, there's our contact information. Like I said, if you signed up, uh, I will send out these slides. You'll have all this information. I'll send out the, uh, the PDF for the worksheet. I have plenty of extra copies of the worksheet if you want to take it back and spend some time doing it with your, with your group. And if you do that, I would love to hear any stories if you can find any additional comments you have. Obviously, this is a, a small, like I said, tip of the iceberg type thing. As Steve was saying, a you know, real value stream mapping might take a month and, and 100 people getting together over the course of that month to come up with all these steps. This is, you know, let, let's just get an idea of how to start it and figure out what our process is. So I hope that was all useful. Yes. I hope you guys leave it out of it. Thank you very much.